Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. When I worked as a grade school teacher, fourth grade specifically, I'd never faced any problems with the kids I taught. Nothing more than the typical boisterous boys, who I suppose nowadays would have been chalked up to undiagnosed ADHD and girls who might have been a bit too cruel to one another, in the way all children need time to grow to be kinder when dealing with classmates. This was before the time of widespread use of computers in schools, and in the small town of Witness, in the lower southeastern part of Iowa, there would be a long wait for our left-behind town to see computers enter our school system. It wasn't the worst thing to be dealing with the old-fashioned way of education, Filing papers and student files for classes of no more than 10 to 12 students didn't make my life complicated. Witness was extremely tight-knit. I never had to worry much about getting into contact with parents, and more often than not, had been invited for dinner at my pupils' houses in order to grow comfortable with the community. As the new girl in town, it seemed accustomed to be thrown straight into the town's communal nature and within my first year moving there, I'd come to know almost every resident by name. And they were all more than happy to accommodate the fresh, new thing from Manhattan that would surely bring some quality teaching tactics to their otherwise crumbling education system. I was fresh out of college when I moved to Witness. Truth be told, I hadn't been entirely honest with my reasoning for moving to the town to its residents. To them, they'd assumed that my education in Manhattan made me something of a higher class, a shiny, bright person that was far more worldly than anyone they'd ever met before. Someone who'd been well-versed in the ever-changing landscape of the time, who'd had a great education at one of the best colleges around. It wasn't entirely untrue, but their praise for me came more out of their own failings at the hands of a state government that didn't see fit to pour money into a dwindling town like Witness. Their awe at my intelligence was no more than their inability to have explored their own, and their interest in my so-called worldly life was born from their powerlessness to leave the town they'd grown up in. My untruthfulness came more from the fact I withheld information. A left-behind place like Witness probably wouldn't have taken kindly to the fact that I'd moved here to leave my previous life behind. A fiancé whom I'd abandoned after his discovery of my abortion would likely have turned their acts of kindness into vitriol and cruel gossip. This was no fault of theirs. It was a time when residents in towns like Witness weren't the most progressive types, and I wouldn't have expected them to change their tune just for me. Besides, I'd preferred to keep my secrets just that, secret, and to start my life afresh with nothing to tie me down. I was 24 when Timmy Thompson and his parents moved to Witness. There had been talk around the town before the new semester. Mrs. Greaves, who worked at the grocery store, had asked me if I'd known about the new kid who'd been scheduled to join my class. I'd been surprised at her question as it was only a week before the semester would begin, and I'd not been alerted of a new arrival by the principal. It wasn't as though we never had new students join the school, but they were few and far between, and the last child to join the grade school had been a young female student who'd joined the same year I'd done, but only for fifth grade, and had then begun to attend the middle school in the next town over which took in students from all the neighboring towns, so I'd not interacted with her much. Mrs. Greaves offered that my lack of knowledge of the new student must have been due to the family moving to town no more than a week before, two weeks before the semester started. She'd gossiped a bit, saying that they'd hardly been into the grocery store save forever the first day of their arrival, and that perhaps the family were cut from a different cloth and must have preferred to shop for their groceries at the Hinky Dinky. I remembered to just smile and nod, realizing that those same sentiments had been held against me at one point, so I'd taken her gossip with a pinch of salt. In the same way that I'd withheld information about my past, 
I'd been sure that others would have their fair share of reasons to do the same, and so I decided to wait until I'd eventually meet the parents before I'd make any assumptions about them. It was almost another week until the principal would give me any information on the new student. The Friday before the semester begins, all the teachers and staff come in for meetings and to set up the classroom and hallways in time for the pupils to begin their new school year. The meetings were always brief, discussing the budget for the school year and explaining the allergy policies that never changed, but were still important nonetheless. I'd been stapling some posters on my classroom's display boards when Principal Dale knocked on my door. He'd seemed a bit skittish, and his red blotchy cheeks did nothing to help his persistently nervous and timid demeanor. He'd asked me to join him in his office to discuss the new student. I'd accepted, but wondered why he wouldn't have just spoken about it in the classroom. My questions would be answered when he slid a small file over to me with the name Timmy Thompson written on the side. I apologize for leaving this so last minute, Miss Harris, but I assure you that it wasn't of my own tardiness. He began, awkwardly sitting upright in his seat. I looked at him to continue, but he'd simply shifted uncomfortably under my gaze. He'd opened his mouth to speak a few times, but had bitten his tongue back constantly, as if trying to find the words to speak. Your new student, Thompson, he's... Well, he has suffered quite a bit recently. I'd grown tired of his rambling and decided to open the file, though he'd quickly stopped me. Miss Harris, I'd advise you to read this through at home, away from prying eyes. I don't believe you to be that kind of person, but gossip spreads fast here, as you know. He'd pulled a tissue from out of the box on his desk, wiping away the sheen that had formed on his balding hairline. With all due respect, Principal Dale, I'm confused as to what it is about. I looked at the file, burning the student's name into my head. Timmy Thompson that you'd like to tell me. Is there something I should be aware of about his arrival? Principal Dale sighed, his shoulders relaxing as the tension left his body. Young Thompson, you see. Well, he... He'd been missing for four months earlier this year. I remember his urgent nodding as I must have shown the shock on my face. They weren't sure what had happened to him. His parents said that he'd simply not returned from school, even though the bus driver had seen him get off at his stop. He sighed again, brows furrowed. It was peculiar, and of course you can imagine the terror those parents must have been through. Well, eventually Thompson just returned home. Not a scratch on him, but he trailed off again, and I can still recall how annoying I'd found his bumbling form of speech. He'd never stopped his timid manner until the day he died. Heart attack, age 62. He's not of a well mental condition. He shouldn't be much trouble in your class. I'm certain of that, but he's... He's rather withdrawn. Didn't speak much at all when his parents brought him in. His parents have arranged for Dr. Fielding to do weekly checkups with him, but I thought it best to let you know of his, um, current faculties. It'd be best that you keep an eye out for him to make sure he adjusts well in the class. The Thompsons have been through a lot, and I'd hate for them to have more on their plate than they already have. I nodded, bidding him farewell as he pardoned me. However, I couldn't contain my curiosity. Timmy, did he? Did the Thompsons ever mention what had happened to him when he was missing? Where he was? Principal Dale looked up at me, shifting his eyes around the room. It would be important for his well-being if I could know as much as possible, so as not to place him under anything that could cause him stress. The principal sighed and motioned to the file in my hands. The Thompson resident's telephone number is in the file. I hadn't thought to ask. I could tell that it was a sore subject for them. I know you won't be disrespectful by any means, but I hope that you know I must reiterate the fact that they've probably dealt with prying eyes for quite some time now. They've come to witness to escape something, and I don't believe they would enjoy having to relive the ordeal. Of course, 
I'd known that they'd not decided on their own accord to move to a place like Witness. The moment I'd heard of Timmy's disappearance and concurrent reappearance, I'd made the connection that they'd probably decided to whisk themselves away to somewhere more private, a place where the residents all knew each other by name and never shied away from involving themselves in each other's business. For a child to disappear without a trace, well, that simply wouldn't happen in Witness. Too many people would have spotted something amiss, and the town would have moved out en masse to find the missing child. As I entered my home and fixed myself a cup of coffee, I'd sat down and proceeded to check the file. Timmy Thompson, I traced my fingers against the name, ensuring I'd never forget it. There was a school picture inside, a lean, taller child with sandy blonde hair and an upturned nose. He was smiling, and a missing front tooth was visible in his grin. I'd wondered whether he'd smiled like that since the disappearance, and I can still remember the pulling on my heartstrings as I thought, probably not. I'd continued to read, finding out that the Thompsons used to reside in Indianapolis, and that until January that year, he'd been receiving pretty good grades on his tests. Then, there was a blank, until it was recorded that he'd been pulled out of school in late April. I realized that I'd have to call his mother to inquire if he'd had any other schooling at that time, and that if he hadn't, he could fall behind. My work had been cut out for me, but I was never the type to leave a child behind. Besides, outside of work, I had plenty of free time to offer remedial lessons if his parents so wished. I waited until around 7.30 p.m. to make a phone call to the Thompson residence. With my experience, parents with children of Timmy's age usually tended to eat dinner early. After a few rings, I heard the phone line connect and a small, quiet voice filled with uncertainty greeted me. Hello, this is Miss Harris, the fourth grade teacher for Witness Elementary. Is this Mrs. Thompson that I'm speaking with? There was a sigh of relief on the other end, and I'd frowned. They must have been pestered with stress. Ah, yes it is. Nice to speak with you, Miss Harris. To what do I owe the pleasure? She exhaled, and I could swear I'd heard the tension melt from her words. Thank you for your time. I hope I'm not disturbing anything. A quick no was exchanged in reply. I'd like to ask some questions about your son, Timmy, if that's all right. Her breath hitched. Just to clear up some things about his education so that we can accommodate him suitably for his new place at school. She sighed in relief once again and beckoned for me to continue. Of course, I've been made aware of your situation, Mrs. Thompson and I would like to extend my sincerest apologies for what you've been through. However, I noticed that in your son's file, you decided to remove Timmy from school in late April. I was wondering if he had any remedial education at this time. If not, which is understandable, I was wondering if you and your husband would like to discuss possible remedial classes to ensure he can catch up to the rest of the class. There was a pause. It was unsettling to be left in silence for so long, and I'd begun to wonder if she'd hung up the phone until she spoke once more. Yes. Sorry. Yes. He did receive some education from me in the hospital. I don't think remedial classes will be necessary, but thank you for your help. Of course, Mrs. Thompson. I was skeptical that the education he'd received would have prepared him for the same level of learning that the other children would be at, but I decided not to press the issue further. Once he'd begin school, I'd find out if he had any missing knowledge that we'd have to work on. Also, I was wondering if there was anything you would personally like me to know about your son. Anything that might help me accommodate his needs, and if there's anything that I should know on a pastoral level that could prevent him from reliving the experience, for lack of a better word. Another long pause. Perhaps she had been speaking to her husband about this. Timmy will be fine. Just try to ensure that he and the other children get along, if you can. She finally responded, 
a shake in her voice that wasn't present before. It unnerved me. We exchanged goodbyes and kind regards, and I was once again left alone to flick through the file, trying to find any inkling of Timmy's character that I hadn't noticed before. Alas, it was just as spick and span as I'd first read it, the only blip in the pristine file being his disappearance, which hadn't been labeled as such, and his subsequent removal from school. There was talk in the town about the Thompsons. They were a young couple, good-looking, according to some. The ladies at the library's book club asked me if I'd seen them yet. I told them I hadn't, and they burst into more gossip, speculating about what job Mr. Thompson had and what products Mrs. Thompson used in her hair. Mrs. Greaves told me that they had indeed returned to the grocery store, only to buy frozen meals and sweet treats. Can't be very healthy for a growing boy, she'd said offhandedly, and I just nodded in response, withholding my knowledge that if my child had gone through such an awful ordeal, I'd probably also feed him whatever he liked. On Monday morning, I'd finally seen the boy in the flesh, a face to the name, but one that looked far different from the photograph in his file. He had been dropped off at school by his father, far earlier than the other children would arrive. His father was handsome and couldn't have been much older than myself, but there was a gauntness in his face that dulled his polite smile. Timmy, as I'd rightly assumed, was tall for his age, and that must have been passed down from his father who towered over the other teachers that flitted about the hallways. The exchange had been brief, with Mr. Thompson excusing himself to go to work, his tie slightly askew from clearly rushing his morning. I took Timmy off his hands and strolled slowly through the halls with him, making small talk as not to overwhelm him. Are you excited for your first day at a new school? I'd asked, smiling as kindly as possible to ease the rigid gait he moved with. He looked up at me briefly, then looked away, gaze fixated on the floor. I guess, he muttered, and I beckoned him to the door of our classroom. It must be quite nerve-wracking, huh? Don't worry, the kids here are really nice. You'll make friends in no time. He nodded in response, not willing to continue conversation. You can sit wherever you like. He moved instantly to the back of the classroom, taking the seat right next to the window. He placed his backpack on the desk and stared outside the window, right at the sky. I watched him carefully as he didn't move his gaze once, just sitting rigidly in his seat. I moved over towards him and lifted his backpack up and pulled open the lid of his desk. You can place your stuff in here. Pretty cool, right? He just nodded and I moved back to desk, pulling out my books and papers ready for the first class. He never looked away from the sky, craning his neck as if to get a better view. I didn't know what he found so interesting about it. It was a cloudy September morning, if I recall correctly. But nonetheless, I didn't think it fit to bother him anymore. Eventually, the children filed in one by one, many of them chatting away happily about their summers and catching up on missed time. Timmy never looked back at any of them, just continued to stare into the sky with a vacant look on his face. The bell rang and I called attention to the class, which all stared back with beaming faces, excited to start the school year. This was the first time Timmy looked away from the window, looking blankly at the front of the classroom. I welcomed all the students and played a small game wherein the students had to state their name and say a small fact about themselves. Many of them said what their favorite hobby was, or color, or food. They all giggled at each other's answers, having known one another for many years at this point, and so I was sure a few answers were inside jokes at my expense. Not that I found it offensive or anything. It was nice to know that my class would be very lively and friendly towards each other. Slowly, Timmy stood up ready to answer. The class looked on eagerly at him, curious faces that goaded him on to say something that would interest them. He never looked at any of his peers, just directly at me. My name is Timmy Thompson, and I don't have any fun facts. He sat down and stared back out of the window. 
The other children looked at one another and at me, confused at his response. I laughed to try to ease the tension, which seemed to calm the children's nerves. Very funny, Timmy, but actually that's a fun fact in itself, not having any fun facts. A few of the other children giggled, and I believed I'd rectified the situation, as there were no more prying gazes angled towards Timmy for the rest of the morning. The day went as usual, and when they were dismissed for morning break, I wandered off to the staff room to fetch myself a cup of coffee. The staff room had a clear view of the playground, wherein I could see all the children playing with one another and in good spirits. I spotted Timmy stood near the swing set, speaking to a group of boys from my class. He really was tall for his age, standing a head taller than all the other boys. I suppose that would do him favors. Popularity at that age was always chalked down to who was the strongest or fastest. The other boys chirped happily alongside him, even though he'd only respond now and again with a short statement. The next month went swimmingly. Timmy had garnered some popularity amongst the boys, as I'd assumed he would, and was even popular with some girls in the class. I had been wrong to assume that he may have fallen behind due to his lack of schooling, but his tests and homework proved otherwise, and he had been nothing short of a straight-A student. The only issue was that he never smiled, and often grew distracted by the outside world, daydreaming as he stared into the sky. I didn't call him up on it, though. As long as he had friends and did well in school, what he did in the classroom was none of my concern, especially since he wasn't distracting anyone. It was only after a lunch break in late October when things began to seem amiss with Timmy Thompson. I'd been eating my lunch in the classroom when a young boy, Eric Lowitz, came rushing in, tears running down his cheeks. Miss Harris, he yelped, barely forming a coherent sentence. Timmy broke his leg. I rushed outside, following Eric as he pleaded with me to hurry up, my long skirt getting in the way of my movements. But when we came outside, Timmy stood tall in the middle of a crowd of his peers, looking underwhelmed and almost vacant as if he wasn't there. He was looking up at the large oak tree that stood in the playground, staring intently at the thick, twisted branch that emerged from it. I'd panicked, asking if he was okay and where he'd been injured. The crowd dispersed and I saw that Timmy had not a scratch on him, and certainly not a broken leg. The only thing missing was a piece of his shoelace that couldn't be seen anywhere. Timmy tilted his head as if to force a confused look on his face. Though he still looked as disinterested and blank as ever, he responded that he hadn't a clue what I was talking about, and I turned to Eric, a stern voice asking him why he'd said that Timmy's leg had been broken. Eric opened his mouth to speak, exasperated, before suddenly his features dulled, and he looked around absently. Um... Sorry, miss. I don't know what you're talking about. He replied, scratching his head. It seemed he was just as confused as I was, and I demanded the crowd of my pupils explain what happened. They looked at each other and shrugged, unsure of why I'd burst into their playtime with such intense vigor and distress. Timmy walked forward without any indication that he'd hurt his leg and turned away to look at the tree. I think Eric thought I was going to hurt myself climbing the tree. I didn't even climb it though. He must have made a mistake. He stated, monotonously. He turned slightly to look over his shoulder, and I felt a coldness in his eyes as he stared back at me. I was bewildered. It seemed like such a grandiose entrance for Eric to make if there'd been nothing amiss to begin with. I decided to pardon myself and not distress the children any further, opting to make a detour to Mr. Fitzgerald's classroom, the third grade teacher. Miss Harris, everything all right? He'd asked, placing his sandwich down on the foil on his desk. He stood up to pull a chair over for me, but I waved him off. Yes, just a, um, misunderstanding with some of the kids. Nothing serious, I replied still feeling the adrenaline pump through me from running to unneeded aid. 
Did... Did the kids last year ever play pranks on you? He quirked an eyebrow, but then chuckled, shaking his head. Sometimes just the classics, though. Shock pens, whoopee cushions. He trailed off, concern reaching his features as he looked me over once more. Why? Have they taken it too far? No, no, I just... Did Eric Lowitz ever make up tall tales? Like as a prank of sorts? I prodded further. Eric? Oh no, he was good as gold. Maybe a bit of a snitch, but there's no harm in that. Helps us keep the kids in check. He responded, smiling. Mr. Fitzgerald would always smile, and he had a lovely one too that would put all the kids and parents at ease. I thanked him and excused myself and returned back to my classroom. I'd found the whole ordeal so bizarre to wrap my head around that I'd decided to write it down in my diary to make sure I'd not forget it. I don't know why I would think I'd lose memory of the situation, but there was a pressing urge to record my thoughts, and so I had done. In early December, I had tasked the children to work on a project about space, the Apollo 17 landing fresh in their own and their parents' memories, which proved exciting for the kids. Every Wednesday afternoon after lunch, my pupils would work on their posters, chatting amongst themselves about whatever it was that they'd wanted to focus on. The project was broad. Anything they wanted to cover about space could be covered, as long as they'd kept everything as factual as could be. Most of the afternoons would entail decorating their posters, as homework would be spent on researching and preparing the content on the page. I would wander around the classroom, peering at their work and asking questions about their themes, and more often than not, reminding them that no, the planet of the apes isn't an actual planet, and yes, the Earth is the only planet with life on it. It was quite adorable, and projects were always my favorite part of the school semester. Allowing the kids to explore something that interests them on their own terms was always a very enriching experience for them. Timmy Thompson proved to be enamored with the project, his focus directed entirely on the poster in front of him, and never allowing himself to be distracted by the other children and their incessant pestering to find out what his theme was. I hadn't wanted to pry, as it was the first time I'd seen the boy enjoy his lessons that much, and it warmed my heart to see him enjoying himself. I had planned for the children to present their posters on the last day of the semester and let them leave school early afterward. It went as expected, their posters all designed in a way unique to them and with information that was clearly written with help from their parents. Timmy had been close to last to present his poster, other children all being far more eager to raise their hands as high as they could to be picked to present next. He moved in a sunken manner to the front of the room, his hands tightly clasped around his poster, leading it to crinkle at the edges. At the time, I'd believed it to be nerves, a social anxiety that wouldn't seem unfitting for the boy who had many friends, but never opted to speak much. His project had been on our solar system, a particularly broad topic compared to his peers. He'd explained the distance between all the planets and their general states from what we knew of them back then. He talked about how Earth was a Goldilocks planet, the perfect climate for life to grow and exist. There was nothing incredulous about his project, but when it came to peer questioning, his demeanor changed entirely. As opposed to his previous withdrawn and anxious disposition, he became animated, answering questions head-on and with vigor, as if he enjoyed the interest placed in his project by his peers. I couldn't help but smile, feeling warmed by the typically quiet boy enjoying his time at school and finally beginning to move onwards from the tragedy that befell him earlier in the year. I had made my mind up that Timmy would be given an A+. His presentation and engagement with his peers was nothing short of perfect. That was until Jenny Powell, a short blonde girl whose mother cut my hair, asked him a question. Why didn't you talk about Pluto? Pluto's my favorite. She giggled, her braids swinging as she slapped a whispering deskmate's hands away.
The kids waited, eager ears ready for whatever the smartest kid in the class would offer to them. Even I'd turned to muse his possible response, surprised that I'd not picked up on the missing planet. Timmy stood there, silent. His gaze was unwavering as he stared young Jenny down, who began to shrink under his gaze. It was neutral, eyes fixated on the girl like she was a mark on a wall that he'd never noticed before. He then turned to look at me, dead in the eyes, and a small smirk blessed his lips. I'd felt intimidated, and before I could speak to quench the tension, he spoke instead. That's because Pluto isn't a planet. He grinned, rolling his eyes at the shocked murmurs that emanated from his peers. He lowly shook his head, and I could tell that he was trying to hold back a scoff, his bitten bottom lip and mirthful eyes giving it away. I'd asked him to sit down, and for the class to give him applause as they'd done for all other presentations, and told them that Pluto was still a planet, and told Timmy not to make jokes in school projects. He'd merely stared back at me, the same vacant, uninterested expression as I'd grown accustomed to, before staring out the window until the class was dismissed for winter break. When the next semester began, I'd decided to make a seating plan, a way for the rowdier kids to settle down by being placed next to the quieter kids, who in turn might come out of their shell more. It was a common tradition in our school, let the kids bond and acclimatize to the new setting in the first semester, and then get them to focus more in the second. It was just a whim, a decision that I hadn't put much thought into. There were only a handful of kids in the class anyway, and so they were never far away from any of their friends. None had any issues with the new seating arrangement, save for Timmy, who'd asked if he could please sit next to the window again. I told him no, that sometimes we have to do things we don't want to, and how school was meant to prepare them for work life like that. It's a sentiment I no longer hold, but at the time, that narrative was instilled in us as teachers. To integrate into society, you had to do things you didn't want to, otherwise you'd be coddled. He scowled, but never made a big issue about it. Just sat down and made a point to veer his head directly toward the window, despite being at the front of the classroom and closer to the door. A few days later, his parents had asked to meet with me, but not in their home for dinner as others had. So there I was, sat at a makeshift table with desks pulled together, watching the Thompsons avoid my eyes as much as they could. It was the first time I'd seen Mrs. Thompson in person. Unlike her husband, she was very small, her thin frame giving her a mouse-like appearance, and although I could tell that at one point she had been beautiful, the thick worry lines had dimmed her significantly. She couldn't help but scratch at her wrist, a nervous tick that she cringed at whenever she'd become aware of her mannerisms. Mr. Thompson was far less handsome than I had remembered him to be, and far more sickly. His cheeks hollow and the heavy purpling under his eyes had aged him a few years. I could see whiskers of gray in his five o'clock shadow, and neither of them seemed comfortable being in my presence. It's nice to meet you both, I'd said, offering a hand out to Mrs. Thompson, whose eyes widened in shock at the gesture. She'd looked to Mr. Thompson, who quickly shook his head at her, and she pulled her gaze back to her lap, scratching at her wrist again. I'd narrowed my eyes at him, disgusted by his controlling nature. However, he offered me a terrifying gaze, one that could only be attributed to a deer in headlights. He held a finger to his lips and proceeded to point lamely toward the classroom window. I frowned, confused, and asked, What's wrong? I assume you've called me in here for a reason? Why are you... He slammed his fist on the desk before him, his face void of color and knuckles white. He trembled, and before I could stand up to call for Principal Dale, he motioned his hands as if writing on a piece of paper green eyes drilling into my own. His wife scratched with more fervor. We called to see you today about our son, Timmy. He stated, trying to stop the waver in his voice. He'd continued to mimic writing something down, and so I'd opened my journal on a blank page to give it to him. 
He began to write, but continued to speak. We hear you've made a new seating arrangement. We were hoping to ask if he could sit in his old seat to accommodate, um, his situation. He'd finished writing and then handed me the journal back. Keep speaking only to what I ask you. Don't say anything you see written out loud. Are you both okay? I'd begun, and he furiously tapped the page, pulling a finger to his lips. His wife mouthed the Lord's Prayer next to him. I began to grow chilly, and my gaze drifted toward the window. I was drawn back to the conversation when Mr. Thompson began to write and speak. You'd asked us about accommodations for our son, so all we ask is that you allow him to sit in his favorite seat, for comfort reasons. He pushed the journal toward me, and I froze. He's listening. He knows that you know something. Don't speak. This is the only chance we have. I see. Well, Mr. Thompson, sometimes we have to do things we don't like. I can offer school counseling to your son if necessary, I responded as I wrote on the journal. Elaborate. We understand that, Miss Harris, but it can cause some distress for our son to not have things that comfort him, make him feel safe. Counseling won't be necessary, as he receives it every Thursday, he said. That is not our son. I scoffed, shaking my head. Mrs. Thompson whipped her head up, a new fury that seemed unnatural to her face. How can you laugh about this? Do you know what we've... She was promptly silenced by her husband gripping her thigh, nodding his head toward the classroom window. Fear and grief washed over her face, and she shot me an apologetic yet distressed look before continuing to look down at her lap, the scratching beginning once more. I understand that what happened with Timmy was truly awful. I will try my best to rework a seating plan that can fit to your son's needs. I trembled out truly disturbed by the erratic parents that sat before me. I didn't want to entertain them at the time. I was more unnerved by the fact that one of my pupil's parents were clearly suffering a mental breakdown. Timmy's father continued to write erratically, glancing constantly to the window. Thank you, Miss Harris. We knew you'd help us. Don't leave the other children alone with him. With that, they promptly left not bothering to speak to Principal Dale, who'd been hovering outside the classroom nervously, hoping that we'd not done anything to make the young Thompson upset. They quickly rushed out, and Mrs. Thompson gave me one last look, a look of relief and warning, as if she'd passed the baton of responsibility onto me. It was mid-January when I'd noticed the children become strange, their memories lax, and their mannerisms slow. They seemed drained and tired. It wasn't unusual for January. Having a birthday then myself meant I wasn't unaware that January was a depressing month for most, and the lack of daylight certainly did nothing to invigorate the children's enthusiasm for school. All the best holidays had passed, and all they could do was hope to see summer as soon as possible. Yet I hadn't missed the clear personality shifts in some. Eric Lowitz never spoke, and he'd cry to me about how stressed he had been, without telling me what it was that had upset him. Even when calling the Lowitzes, they'd been unnerved to hear about his actions in school, as he'd been nothing but gleeful at home, speaking about his best friend Timmy and how much he loved my classes. Jenny had become nearly mute, never willing to answer questions in lessons and nervously shifting in her desk whenever Timmy spoke. But her mother, my hairdresser, spoke nothing but praise about how Jenny had really come out of her shell at home and how she loved talking about school. The only difference was Timmy was the same as always, albeit his gaunt demeanor from the first semester was swapped for a new one, one that glowed and showed the same energy as the child I'd seen in the picture in his file. It hadn't truly unnerved me until I'd been at the Winter Festival. The Winter Festival was something that Witness loved to indulge in, a festival with live music, stalls, 
dancing and activities to ease those morose from the penniless weeks they'd suffered post-Christmas. It kept joviality within the community, and everyone was glad to see it come close. I'd taught my kids some songs to sing, as the elementary school always did an intermittent show between the local teenaged and older bands that would play, and they'd sang until their lungs could burst, a young Josiah enthralling the crowd with his voice. He ended up being on Broadway, so I could never forget the angelic voice that emanated from him, especially being one of the more withdrawn kids in my class. I'd had a few drinks, due to the kids having their parents around and Mr. Fitzgerald goading me on to finish some maple-flavored whiskey he'd been gifted. I'd been speaking to Mrs. Greaves, who'd held up an apple-bobbing stall when Mr. Fitzpatrick returned with some water. He'd asked, Have you seen the Thompsons? His perfect smile crinkled with unease at the corners of his mouth. Mrs. Greaves kissed her teeth, shaking her head. Those poor babies... Nothing but pain that whole thing has caused, she uttered, tapping a teenager's hand away from the apples floating at the top. She must have noticed my confusion, and she'd continue with, that child's a menace, making the children do terrible things. I just saw them walk over there, she ushered, wafting her hand towards the long, vacant public path, probably to set off fireworks. Don't leave the other children alone with him and I ran Mr. Fitzgerald hot on my tail. I ran and ran until I saw them. A group of my students stood around Timmy Thompson. They had vacant expressions, eyes white and empty, like they'd all been hypnotized by something I couldn't see. Timmy stood all around them, smiling before pulling his hand upwards, beckoning to the sky. I screamed out, screaming for him to stop. I don't know what compelled me, perhaps the drink, as it's all such a faded memory now. Timmy stopped. Scowling, he picked up Eric Lowitz and Jenny Powell and ascended into the air. The other children screamed and cried, begging to be taken with them. I ran forward, but a harsh grip on my arm kept me back. Mr. Fitzgerald held my arm, stuck and frozen as he stared blankly into the sky eyes completely white with no pupil to be seen. I looked up and I saw it. I'm not sure if I can call it a UFO. It wasn't an object or anything akin to one. It was a mouth, a hole in the air that wasn't in the atmosphere or could even be explained in dimensional terms I could dictate. It was a mouth, lips pink and teeth human that began to suck air inwards into the dark cavity of its throat and Timmy and Jenny and Eric were pulled up into its mouth and it gulped before pursing its lips and spitting only Timmy out. He'd wiped himself off and the other children returned to normal, bickering about why they'd been brought here and how they were hungry. Mr. Fitzgerald's grip stilled and loosened and he asked me why I'd been so distraught. For a second, I forgot why. I had no recollection until I'd looked Timmy in the face and it all came crashing back. He knew that I knew what he'd done, and smirked, chuckling lightly into the back of his hand. A day later, the Thompsons left town. The kids in my class kept asking about him, and then a week later, nothing else was ever spoken of again. In fact, I'd forgotten about it entirely until recently, when I'd reread my diary from that time. There was an urge to, after hearing about a homeless woman in witness, one who'd been a staunch business person and with no mental health problems, who after going insane had been hallucinating a missing child. I live back in Manhattan now, but the story irked something in me, an urge to know more. I read through my diary entries, reading the passages I'd made. I'm glad I'd remembered Eric Lowitz and Jenny Powell because they don't exist, at least not that their parents could remember. We all just went back to our normal lives, and soon we simply became as unknowingly complicit in Timmy Thompson's plan as we'd been all along. It would be wrong to call Timmy the Pied Piper. That would make it seem as though Timmy himself was responsible for the culling of people in the town of Witness, where people never miss a missing person. Because I'm not sure I ever met the real Timmy Thompson to begin with. <laughs>